I'm, I'm, I'm curious, who are all my rule followers here in the room? Rule followers? Like, if you're a rule follower, you should just pop your hand right up because that's the rules, right? Pastor asks, who are the rule followers? Like, so if you're a rule follower, you're just like, rules are there for a reason, right? The rules are there to, to help us, to guide us, to give some guardrails there, you know, to protect us, that sort of thing. He's shaking his, you see your boy right there, right? <laughs> you know, then there's the flip side. Uh, and, and those of you who didn't raise your hands, I'm assuming there's a lot more of you, which kind of concerns me. But uh, the, the, the rest of you, you're just like the rules were meant to be broken, right? That's why they're there, that sort of thing. Uh, I have been blessed as a father because my daughter is very much of a rule follower, okay, from a very, very young age. Um, she's been very easy for the most part to uh, parent and, and all. She's been a huge blessing for us. And, uh, but she is a rule follower. And I can remember years ago, this is about 10 years ago, I think. She was seven years old. She was in second grade. Like she's about to turn 17 now, right? I'm going to mention how, how quickly time flies, right? Uh, and so she was, like, she was like this tall, you know, just this cute little thing. Now she's like as tall as me. And then she puts on her, on her three-inch heels and she's like way up here, you know. Um, but she was like this tall. There's second grade. My wife, Amanda, was out of town. I think she was on a girl's trip or something like that. And the parent-teacher conference came up. All right, so, so I'm going with Allie uh, after school back to the, the second grade uh, room. And it, and it wasn't one of those things where you're just sitting down one-on-one -on -one with the teacher. It was a cumulative thing. And so all of the second grade teachers were in the room. The parents were in the room. The, some of the kids, if they came back with us, were, were in there as well. I'm, a, I'm like, I'm the size of a moose. So you can imagine me trying to get stuffed into one of those little second grader sized desks, you know, which I was not getting. I, I think they had to put the desk on me rather than me sitting <laughs> in the desk. And so there we were. And all of the teachers were sharing a little bit about uh, the studies and, and uh, Georgia standards and, and everything like that. Allie's sitting right beside me and Allie being the rule follower that she is. I'm not kidding. Like she is she, prim and proper back just straight as can be. Mary Poppins would have been so proud of her in that moment, you know. And, uh, and I'm kind of a proud daddy as, as well. But the, 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 the teachers are, are sharing all of this stuff. And we're in Georgia to share about the Georgia standards. I, was like, I have no idea what you're talking about right now. And, uh, and so the, one of the teachers says something, and it kind of made me chuckle underneath my breath, right? And, and, and I, didn't, I didn't think about anything. I, I lean over to my daughter right here, and I start to whisper something. And you know what she did to me? You know what my little rule follower did to me? I wasn't expecting this. She gave me a look that could have killed me. She was like, Shh. I mean, just, just like, 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 you better follow the rules, Dad, you know? And you know what I did? I went, I mean, I was scared in the moment. I thought my child was coming out of her desk at me for, for there for a second. And after sitting there for about 20 seconds, it dawned on me. It dawned on me. I'm the dad here, right? Why am I allowing my child to shush me? Because I'm the one, in, or I should be the one in charge. Anyway, it was funny in the moment. It was funnier to me in the moment and, and all. But it, it made me think about, like, like, have you ever, like, felt the pressure to conform you know, you ever felt the pressure to, to copy other people sort of thing? Like from a very young age, we, we just do this, whether we realize it or not. We just copy other people. We do it all the time, you know? As a, as a child, we imitate our parents so much. If I had a nickel or a quarter for every single time, and my daughter made a facial expression that, that, that then my wife said, that is your daughter right there, you know? I'd have a nice little nest egg going on, you know? Because she just, she makes exactly the same facial expressions, you know? Our, our kids grow up into teenagers and they imitate other, other teens. I can remember years ago when Justin Bieber first came out on the scene, like every teenage boy all of a sudden had to have this comb over haircut. You, you all remember that? And everybody was wearing hoodies. Even in the heat of the summer, it's 95 five degrees outside and they're wearing hoodies, you know, and they're like, this is cool. I'm like, no, it's not. It's hot, you know, and, and, and we just imitate, we copy each other, you know, or they watch something on the Disney Channel or Nickelodeon, you know, and then all of a sudden you're walking down this aisle in a, in a department store and right there is the exact same clothes they wore on that TV station. Got to have it, right? And then we do the same thing as adults, Right? We, we end up just imitating and copying as, as adults. It's just that, that we do it with much more expensive things, you know? Like, like you, you know these phrases, right? The only difference between a man and a boy is the price of his toys, right? The apple doesn't fall far from the, like, father, like, we have all 
at some point in another, probably many times, copied our lives, our actions, our words after somebody else. I can, I can remember, well, way back now, uh, for me, I can remember when I first started in ministry almost 25 years ago now. I feel really old, okay? Uh, but the first 12 years I was in ministry, I did music and worship and choirs and cantatas and all that kind of stuff, you know? And, and I can remember, this was back in the, the 90s, uh, and it was like at the, the very beginning of, of what I would call like the modern worship music sort of era thing. I don't know what else to term it, you know, the contemporary music coming out and, and stuff. And so I, I was like, I was, I was brand new. I didn't know like, like I could sing. That was about it. I didn't know what, exactly what to do. And so I copied, you know, I, w- I would watch these, these big name worship leaders like Ron Canoli at the time and, and Darling Check from Hillsong. And I would copy exactly what they did. I would sing the songs exactly the way they did. I would say the exact same thing in the middle of the songs, just like, like they did. And, and, and then when I transitioned into leading a church, like I would copy other speakers for a long time. Like I would listen to just a little bit too much Andy Stanley throughout the week. And, and, and that next Sunday, I'd sound just like Andy Stanley, you know? And then the next week, I'd listen to just a little too much uh, uh, Stephen Furtick. And that Sunday, I'd sound just like Stephen Furtick. I got in a lot of trouble, you know, myself, for me, uh, when, when I just listened to just a little too much T.D. Jakes, right? And I'm like, I'm going to put on my suit and get up there and I start doing this sidestep sort of thing, you know, and just really preaching there. I, just, I did not look good doing that, you know? I just make a fool of myself when I try and doing that and wiping the sweat off my forehead, just copying, trying. You know what we do? We copy others trying to discover ourselves. I don't think we realize that very much. We copy others in the process of trying to discover ourselves. Copying others is exactly what zombies do, except they never discover themselves. They just continue on throughout life copying others. We're concluding this, this some kind of zombie message series today talking about how, how, how to cope in life when you feel like you're the last one alive. Okay. We, we watch like zombie movies or TV shows like the walking dead and that sort of thing. And we see people in there who, who, who have been running for their life. You know, they've been killing zombies and running for their life for, for on and on and on and on. And they're tired. They're exhausted. They're ready to give up. They're just like, just bite me already. I'm ready to conform and, and just be like every other zombie because I'm tired. Maybe you walked in here feeling like that today. Well, you're tired. Life has been beating you up. And you're like, you know what? I give up. I'm just going to copy everybody else, right? If, if, if that's you, I'm going to tell you something today. When you find yourself in that position, like peer pressure to do something you know you shouldn't do or or act the way you shouldn't act or go somewhere the way you you, you, you shouldn't go or or, or just just whatever it is, I want you to remember two words. This is the bottom line for today, all right? It's just two words. Typically, the bottom line that I give you on a Sunday morning is a little bit longer. and, And my hope, my desire is that afterwards, if you remember only one thing, it is that bottom line, even if you have to paraphrase it, that's okay, okay? Today... It's just two words. Like, you can remember two words, all right? Can you, can you remember two words? You can remember, there's, there's going to be a test at the end of the message. Okay, I'm telling you, today there will be. Two words, that's it. It's just two words. Are you ready? When life feels like that, don't copy cat, copy Christ. When you don't know who else to copy, when you can't, dis, you can't figure it out on your own, you're just like, I don't know who I am. Don't copy somebody else. Don't copy the ways of this world. Don't copy the things you see on TV or social media. You copy Christ. In other words, you imitate Christ. You mimic Christ. You become a Christian chameleon. You don't imitate your pastor. You don't, you don't allow the things in, in here. You look at everybody else and you're like, should I raise my hands at that point? Should I do this? Should I do? You, know, you, don't, you don't allow the things we do in here on a Sunday morning just to become ritual traditions and that's it. Just a list of to-dos and, and, and don'ts, right? You don't imitate anything nor anyone in this world. You copy Christ. That's it. If you still have that bookmark in your Bible to Ephesians, head back to there again in Ephesians chapter 5. And I want to show you just a couple of verses here of what the Apostle Paul says about copying Christ. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, it says, Follow God's Example, Depending on your translation you're reading from, that might say imitate God. Imitate God. Therefore, as dearly loved children, walk in the way. In other words, imitate Christ. 
That's basically what he's saying, right? Walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Copy Christ. Imitate God. Imitate Christ. What's going to keep us from doing that? Let me give you a few things that I think just real life things that are going to keep us from copying Christ. One of the big ones is comparison. And I know that I've talked about comparison a little bit in the past, but I'm telling you, comparison is going to fuel your own self-perception. How you feel about yourself, what you see in the mirror, what you think about yourself, right? It will fuel that. I think we need to dive into this a little bit deeper because it's, it's just a fact of life. We compare ourselves to others all of the time, right? You look at yourself in the mirror, and, and you come away with one of two conclusions. I look good or I don't look good, right? And then we begin to compare ourselves to somebody else and we come away with one of two conclusions. Well, I look better than him or well, I'm a loser. And we become like human Eeyores. Well, I'm just a loser, right? I'm not any good. And, 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 and sometimes we think, there's so many people, like depending on who you compare yourself, we end up with the standard of comparison, right? We have this, this standard, and, and the reason why so many people, I think, in this world think that, that their good is good enough is, is, is they think God must approve them because they're just, they're good enough, and it's all, it's not in how, it's not in, the problem isn't in how, uh, uh, isn't in God's approval, it's the problem is in how we define good, let me say that again because I'm, I'm losing my thought. There's, there's people who think isn't being good good enough, and it's not. They think being good enough will earn God's approval, and it doesn't. The problem isn't in God's approval. The problem is found in how we define good. And more often than not, we define good based on whom we are comparing ourselves to. Paul says there's a different standard. Rather than comparing yourself to somebody else and what they have or don't have or whatever it is, in verse 1, verse one chapter 5, he says, rather than following the examples of, the other, of others, why not just follow the example of God? Copy God. Imitate God. There's a novel idea, right? We're not copying someone else. Copy Christ. There's a couple of things, a couple of traps we fall into, though, when we try to copy Christ like this. One is the competition trap. Everything is a competition in our life, in our world. Everything's a competition, isn't it? I think one of the easiest arenas to, to see this in is sports. Like, that's bottom line. That's what sports is. It's a competition, right? Is this team better than that team? Is this player better or worse than, than that player? You know, does Alabama deserve to be number one or Georgia deserve to be number one? Because it sure ain't our Auburn folks this year, right? You know, is Brady truly the goat? You know, arguably, yes. It's coming from a born and raised Indiana Colts fan. I still have to admit that. But I think one of the number one things that drives us in this world and our culture is competition because we compare ourselves to everyone else and we create this comparison standard that we define in our own minds and then based on that standard is where we will fall as far as how we feel about ourselves, our own self-perception. There's a guy in the Old Testament and he is labeled, other than Jesus Christ uh, himself, uh, he is labeled in scripture as being the wisest man to have ever walked the planet. His name is Solomon. Many of you are familiar with him. And uh, he, this guy was like filthy, rotten, rich. He had more possessions than anybody has ever had, more, more wealth, more gold, more armies, you name it. He had it all. And here's what he said about what we're talking about today. He said this himself. And, and this is amazing to me because it takes every single one of us, no matter who we are, and places us all in the same boat. Like, it doesn't matter your background, it doesn't matter your ethnicity, it doesn't matter uh, uh, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, it doesn't matter whether you're, you're popular growing up or you're a nerd, it doesn't matter whether you're a, a president of a Fortune 500 company or working in a mailroom, it doesn't matter who you are, we're all in the same boat with what Solomon says right here in chapter 4, verse 4. He says, then I observed that most people are motivated to success because they envy their neighbors. They envy their neighbors. And here we are thousands of years later in 2021 and it's exactly the same 
Everything is exactly the same. Andy Stanley says it like this. He says, all of us are using someone else to look at as our mirror. In other words, you're not looking at a mirror in your bathroom. You're looking at somebody else, and you're comparing yourself to that person. And that, that's what determines your standard you know, in, in your comparison of whether I'm good enough or I'm not good enough. Whether I feel good about myself or I don't feel good about myself. Right? Paul says, don't copy somebody else. Copy Christ. And then the second trap is the insecurity trap. And I think the competition and the insecurity trap, they actually feed into each other. You know, the more, con- the more competitive you get, the more insecure a lot of people get. And the more insecure you feel, the more co- you try to compete a lot of times. It's like this mental cycle we just kind of get stuck in and very rarely can, can break out of. Our insecurities drive us to do things we wouldn't normally do, or drive us to measure up, or drive us to, 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 to be just as good and, and have just as much and just look like the next person. At the core of all of that underneath is insecurity more often than not. Am I good enough or am I just not good enough? Peter says this. This is an amazing passage, y'all. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. He says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. All right, I said it last Sunday. If you, if you were with us, I'm going to say it again. You are not a mistake. You might have had parents that told you you were a mistake, but God knew exactly what he was doing when he created you. You were not created by mistake. God knew exactly what he was doing. And according to what Peter says here, he chose you. He chose you. Just let that sink in for just a moment. Like, I, I, would, I would never, for students, I would never wish upon any one of you to, to fail horribly a test. But I want you to understand a failed test does not define you unless you allow it to. Adults, you lose your job, for example. That loss of a job does not define you unless you allow it to. Maybe your spouse leaves you, divorces you, and that that season of life will only define you if you allow it to define you. Some of you going through hurts and hangups and recovery type stuff. Those seasons in your life will only define you if you allow it to. When God, I want you to understand, when God looks down, I promise you, God doesn't see a failure. He doesn't see somebody who lost his job. He doesn't see a failed marriage. He doesn't see somebody who's failed in in, in life. When God looks down, he doesn't see some useless, pointless zombie. Peter says that God sees his special possession. You are a chosen people. Listen, listen. He didn't have to choose you. God doesn't need us. He wants you. That's how valuable you are. See, here's, here's what creates, I think, what I have seen, all this, a lot of this discontentment in our lives. It, it, it's, it's one thing that drives our comparison, our competitions, our insecurities. It's simply how aware we are of what is going on around us. That awareness, it can fuel this discontent in our lives. When you're aware of what the neighbors have, it's, it's, it's when you find out there was another child who got a little bit better grade than your child you know, in, in that class. Or, or at the workplace, you find out that there was somebody that you thought was, was lateral to you, and then you find out they get paid a little bit more than you, and you are now aware. And it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's, that's not fair, right? And we become a little discontent. Solomon goes on, he says in verse six, he says, better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil. You look up the word tranquility, here's what you get. Free from commotion and turmoil. Peaceful. Quiet. Calm. Unaffected by disturbing emotions. Unagitated. That's what I need. 
Other things agitate me too much. Serene. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of like sometimes it's just like, ooh, sir. we just got to relax and take a breath, take a step back, right? And just ask, are the things that I'm agitated about, that I'm disturbed about, the things that are sucking tranquility out of my life, is this really worth it in the long run? Like, is, is, is the thing that I'm up in arms about right now really matter? Or honestly, is it really rather petty? Like when, when, when's the last time When's the last time you experienced any of those? Like truly just like I'm in God's presence and I exp- like many of the moms are like that would have been before my child was born, right? <laughs> you know? Or maybe for you it was like I got I, I think I felt a little bit of that on vacation. You know why hopefully you experience a little bit of that on vacation? It's called different place, different pace, different perspective. That's what vacations hopefully will do for us. You're getting out of the normal context of your everyday life, right? And so you're not aware of everything going on back home. You can kind of push it to the the side just a little bit. You don't wake up before the sun rises to get to work on time, you know, when you're on vacation. I hope you don't. That's just weird, you know. Uh, You you don't come home to loads of laundry that, that has to be done. You don't go out to the mailbox while you're on vacation to get the unexpected bill, right? You're, you're not living within the context of, of your normal everyday life. But when you get back home, what happens? Boom. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Now you see the grass that needs to be mowed, right? You can see the loads of laundry that needs to be washed. You, you can see the unexpected bill that came in the mail while you were gone. Now you're, you're aware. You're aware of everyone and everything around you. And, and it's so easy to just instantly become discontent. And Solomon says, what would it be like rather than doing this, you do that? Right? Like as hard as it is to believe that that is even possible, what could it be like? Here's what we do most of the time. I want more, I want more, I want more, I want more. I'm gonna fill up this hand and it's full and I don't have anywhere to put any more in this hand, so what do I do? Because I want more. I start filling up this hand. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. I want more, I want more, I want more. And then this hand fills up. Now I got two hands filled up, but I still want more because I'm still discontent. What happens? What do I do with it now? There's nowhere to put it. I have to live. I'm forcing myself into a life of discontent. And Solomon says, what would it be like to just let that go and just live with one hand full with peace in mind? That's what it can look like when you copy Christ. That's what it can feel like when you copy Christ. Christ. What would your life look like if you only filled up one hand rather than the other? Paul says, imitate God. How? He says it right there. Walk in the ways that Christ walked. Love the way Christ loved. Be willing to sacrifice the way Christ sacrificed. And I can't explain this. It's a mystery to me. But as you strive and you focus to copy Christ, you end up living a life of peace and tranquility. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30 says, a heart of, at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bone. Rots. In other words, envy isn't something that is this outward sort of thing that just bounces off of you. Envy is something that happens in here. It rots from the inside out. Here's the challenge. If, if we all face what we're talking about today, and I think that we all do, what's the trick? What's the key to finding contentment? If we're bombarded with, with I, I, I'm, I'm just, it's just our natural instinct to compare myself to others, right? There's no way 
that, that, that you're going to be oblivious to everything and everyone around you. You're right. You're always going to be aware of that. How do we fight this? How, how, how do we measure up? Here it is. It sounds so simple. And it's, it's simply said, but it's a little more difficult to live out. And it's just two words. Copy. Here's a test. Christ. Copy. Don't forget it. We're in that moment. You're like, I don't know if I should do that. I don't know if I should buy that. I don't know if I should take out that loan. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Copy Christ. Copy Christ. We have an opportunity to copy him right now. To do something that he himself did with his disciples on the night that he was betrayed. And that's partake of communion. And so I just want to ask you, if, if you have not yet gotten your communion cup, they're back there on those tables, go ahead and run back there and grab those. If you have your communion cup, I want to ask you to just go ahead and open that thing up because those things make a racket. Just go ahead and open that up and get that little piece of bread out. Open that next piece up so you're ready to partake of the juice. I want to go back to the passage I read earlier from 1 Peter. Can I read this one more time for you? He says, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are God's special possession. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light the reason you are a chosen people is because of one thing the reason you are God's special possession is because of one reason the reason you have the opportunity today in your life to copy Christ is because of one thing and that is because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross some 2,000 or so years ago today as you Partake of that bread that represents his body as you drink the cup of juice that represents his blood. I'm going to pray. We're going to worship with another song. But I want you to remember this. As you reflect back on this last week, as you ask God to forgive you of your sins again, I want you to reflect on this, that God chose you. God chose you. And because of that, you can copy Christ. Let's pray, and then you may partake of communion when you're ready. Our Father God, thank you again for this amazing day that you've given to us. God, for the opportunities <clears throat> that we have to copy you. God, it's, 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 it's not just about us. It's about those who see us as well. It's about each person who sees who we are and what we do and how we act and how we respond. And our, do we have tranquility in our lives, lives of peace, or are we just zombies? God, I pray for each person here in this room, those watching online right now, as we partake of this bread and this juice. God, on behalf of each person here in this room, you would forgive us again of our sins. God, we know we don't have to ask over and over. But I think it's good for us personally to recognize each of us have fallen short of the glory of God. And we have all sinned. But we've all been forgiven. That we are free. That we are a chosen people. That we are special. God, we love you and give you all the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.